Welcome to part two of this two-part series with an interview with Peter Greenberg. In this episode, we're discussing more on cruising post-COVID and his thoughts on what is to come in the future of travel. And if you missed part one, it'll be linked in the description box below. Let's dive right into the interview. You have in throughout your tenure, you've had the opportunity to sit down with so many uh, CEOs of cruise lines, key industry leaders and everything like that. And uh, they've shared, you know, the passion for cruising and everything like that. Can you tap into anything of where you've met with them and kind of looking back on those conversations that you've had in the past and how they thought cruising was going to take a certain direction and the projections on where cruising was supposed to go you know, the upward trends of, you know, so many new cruisers to the market and everything. This is just like a, uh, a real big halt to everything. Yep. Um, I'd love to hear your well, thoughts. I've spoken probably to every CEO of every cruise line. Uh, and they all shared one thing in common up until recently. They were promoting cruising. I get yeah. that. They were talking about, you know, this untapped market, because if you actually look at the real numbers, not that many Americans have ever been on a cruise ship right? It's, it's an industry that's still in its infancy. Right. So I get that. But now they're going to have to take that playbook and throw it out. Now they can't promote cruising. They have to present the process. I don't want to know about my suite or the jacuzzi or the, or the rock climbing wall or the racetrack on board. I want to see the hazmat team in my cabin getting it ready for me. People are now focused on process. And by the way, cruise ships have no monopoly on that. Hotels and airlines the same. So it's not going to be, look, I've seen cruise ship pricing as ridiculous as $28 a night right now. Yeah. Uh, and that's the old playbook. You know, the industry always felt they could discount their way out of it. You know what ends up when they do that? The first person who discounts, the other, the other cruise lines have to, have to match it, and they all get their ass kicked. Yeah. And they don't necessarily generate traffic, especially in this market where people want to see that hazmat team before they go anywhere near a cruise. The price isn't um, going to motivate you at this point. It's well, you want price to will get your attention, but it's not going to get you on the ship. Right. Now, you may have a couple of people who've never cruised before who want to throw the dice and go, oh, my God, 28 bucks a night. I, it's cheaper than living in Orlando. I'll go. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, and, and it is. You know, when, when, you know, you can't wake up in Orlando for $28 a night. You know, and I, I'm not just picking on Orlando. Let's no, say Cleveland. It's, it's because, many cities. Right. But the reality is that might have driven traffic before, and it probably did. Now, because of family and friends' influence, the internet, the, the, the speed at which information flows, you're gonna have, uh, the, my message to the cruise lines is you're going to have to do better than thinking that price is going to save you or discounting is going to save you. You're not going to discount your way out of this. You may generate some incremental traffic, but the bottom line is you've got excess capacity now that you've never had before because you still have all these, these shipyards producing ships at 100% capacity of every size and pedigree. And they're coming online now. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be coming online through 2022. You got to fill those as well. Right. So what you're going to have to do to the extent that you can is go in there, use this opportunity to get some of these ships into dry dock and reorganize the floor plan so that people can still have a shared experience and be compliant with basic, you know, common sense public health protocols. Yeah, but, but what's really interesting is comparing aviation to cruise lines is aviation, the bookings are, have, you know, dropped to the floor, but bookings for cruise lines are, are, are they're still getting bookings from, you know, now into next year. Uh, itineraries like Alaska have gone up and, you know, particularly uh, certain cruise lines have also opened up their 2022 sailings, which is about Well, of course they're going to open them up. Why wouldn't you open them up? You right, have nowhere to go but up. But here's the thing, you know, Carnival announcing they were going to cruise in August, please, they're, they're on crack. <laughs> Not going to happen. The Alaska cruise season that you mentioned is dead this year. Right. D-E-A-D, because of the Jones Act. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who understands the Jones Act or doesn't, I'll explain it. Canada has barred cruise ships from their ports through at least the end of June, maybe the end of July. Because of the Jones Act, that's why so many uh, cruises to Alaska start in uh, Canada, because under the Jones Act, no ship other than a ship registered in the U.S., I challenge you to name one ship that's registered in the U.S., other than maybe one of the Hawaii cruises, um, and they got a special exemption from the Jones Act for that. The rule is, if you're not registered in the U.S., you cannot sail between two U.S. ports without stopping in a foreign port first. This is an act passed in 1939 
presumably to save the American Merchant Marine and ended up killing it, but it's still on the books. Right. So unless Canada relaxes the rules and allows the, 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 a port stop there, you can't get from San Francisco to uh, Juneau. You, there's no way to stop in between and a foreign country. So that season's dead. And you talk about future bookings. Oh yeah, there, there are a lot of future bookings right now that they're getting uh, starting for 2021, but they're still down 25 to 30% year over year than this year's future bookings. But it's enough to give people a ray of hope simply because the people who are doing the future bookings, 98% of them are repeaters. And, and they can't wait to go again because they love to cruise. Right. I mean, why not? I right? think a lot of my community and the viewers who are watching are you know, people who love to cruise as well and really resonate with exactly that is that they you know, are hoping and praying for all this to be yeah. over so we can get back. But you know what? But here's the subtext. And the cruise lines don't really have much control over it yet. And that is two subtexts. Number one, I get on a cruise, it's a great cruise, and the passenger in cabin 607 coughs. And the next thing you know, we're, you know, we're stuck at sea and can't get back, or we get to a port and we can't get home from the port. Right. Nobody wants to be, you know, it was, it was ship of fools. That's what they were seeing on, tel on television, right? You know, people without countries drift at sea. Yeah. Uh, those images don't disappear very quickly. They, uh, they resonate. So where's my guarantee from the cruise line, right? They can't give me that guarantee because they have to perform to, to the medical requirements at sea. So we need that vaccine. We need that testing. And the testing has to be done literally the day you get on the ship or the day before. Because saying I was tested negatively a month ago means nothing. Of course. That's why the idea of an immunity card is, 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 is well-intentioned, but nothing but theatrical. Because I can carry a card that said I tested negative in March and I'm getting on the ship in April, a lot can happen between March and April. So we need that to give people the confidence, uh, the assurance, and the trust to get back on, even people who love to cruise. Yeah, so I think we're looking at multiple testings until then. If it does, everything goes well. We would see multiple testings throughout and then a bunch of travel restrictions through the port. But let's change the topic to some ports. Do you have any favorite ports that you love to travel to? I do, um, and most of them, I would guess most of your audience hasn't been to. Um, Let's give us some travel inspo. Okay, St. Helena. Where is it? Do you know where it is? Uh, off of um, Africa and uh, close to, um, uh, I can't remember the name. It's, you, they just got an airport, right? Very good. You're close. Okay. St. Helena is 1,200 miles east of Angola. Ah, that's the name that I can miles yeah, west Angola. of Brazil. It's between Africa and South America. It's smack dab in the middle of nowhere in the South Atlantic. And for those history buffs, that's where Napoleon was exiled. Most people think Napoleon was exiled to Elba. Well, he was, but he escaped. And he fought the British at the Battle of Waterloo. And as we all know, he lost, and he pissed off the British so much that they said, okay, we're going to send you to the one place you can never escape. Welcome to St. Helena. He <laughs> got there in 1815. He died in 1821. And there you have it. So the, it is a port. And every once in a while, a ship will call on there, and it's amazing. Wow. Um, the other place I love is Port Said. Uh, but you, in order to do Port Said, you got to transit the Suez Canal. And not a lot of U.S. Uh, cruise ships do that, but we did it on a celebrity ship about two years ago. Wow. Uh, I love that port. I love Greenland. Um, you know, not everybody shows up there either, right? <laughs> um, but, I, you know, look, the one port I don't like, I don't like any port where there are seven ships in the port at the same time. Yeah. So St. Thomas, sorry. Eh. You know, St. <laughs> Martin, see you later. Uh, sorry about that, right? Yeah. I think uh, the personality, though, too, is that you you are a big history buff and you want to go to the places that you can really uh, divulge into that history and, you know, play into that. Yeah, that but you want to know something? St. Croix is a, is, is, is a port where you have a lot of ships, but St. Croix has got great history. Right. Great history. But it's so, one or the uh, other. It's too crowded. Yeah. You know what? When I go to any of those locations, I call ahead and I say, what are the three days of the week that the cruise ships aren't there? And that's when I go. Okay. But that's for those ports, right? 
But for the other ports that don't have the frequency and have the history, count me in. Yeah, right? so you're really looking so, to do more of those expedition cruises where it's the very- They don't very... have to be expedition cruises like the Galapagos or the, or the Antarctic, although I've done both. Okay. I'm talking, I'm talking about the whole coast of South America. And, and, uh, and they've got the pirate situation under control, so you can do the whole coast of Africa now. That's good. Uh, yes, and those ports are going to start to open up. Absolutely. You know, before you, you, know, you would sail into Somalia, I don't think so. But now you got a chance. And I like that. Yeah, that that's really fun and definitely opens up, especially if you, you're so traveled that, you know, you need something new and exciting of places that we haven't really heard of or even thought of going to. So that's definitely an eye opener. Yeah, but you know what, though? I'm not, I don't want to be first on my block. Don't get me wrong. I'll go anywhere where I can actually be in a situation where I'm allowed to discover something as opposed to being put on a bus and taken to a souvenir shop. Don't want to do it. <laughs> and my advice to all the cruisers watching is when you're getting ready to go back to cruising, there's a reasonably good chance that you're gonna meet, if you're not going as a family, you're just going as a couple, there's a reasonably good chance you're gonna meet at least one other couple on the ship that you like. And you know what you're gonna do there? You're gonna figure out, let's say you're gonna have a port call, where maybe it's a Sidebecca or, uh, or uh, somewhere on the, on the Italian coast or somewhere on the, uh, on the French Riviera. Call the best hotel in town from the ship you can email them, the concierge, ask them if you can hire a car and driver, have the car and driver meet you at the port. And then you guys split the cost. Now you're no longer on the bus. And now have fun, do your research and go to, go to a restaurant that you wanna to go to and go to one or two locations that are not gonna be crowded with everybody else that you can get to. And, and, those, and for those cruise ships that are doing overnights, mm -hmm. uh, do not pay attention to anything in the brochures. <laughs> And seriously, and what you're going to do is you're going to hire a car and a driver to meet you at the ship at four in the morning. Oh, because you're not sailing till five the after till the next day afternoon, or, or you may not be sailing till one o'clock in the afternoon if it's an overnight. Have them meet you at four in the morning, and then go to the one place you want to see while you're there, right? Well, it could be the Hermitage in Saint Petersburg. It could be it could be the pyramids, you know, in 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 Cairo. It could be the Great Wall in China if you're doing you know, excursions and day trips and you're up there before any bus gets there at all and the, you have the dawn to yourself yeah. and then when you're ready to go back, you'll see the procession of tour buses coming towards you and you'll thank me. <laughs> that is really great advice though, especially for those. Yeah. Pay players. no attention to what time they open. You leave the ship at four in the morning and have that experience. Oh man, early riser. That's not something I'm the best at, but uh, definitely good advice. Listen, I've dragged too many of my friends out of bed at 3.30 in the morning to do it, and they have forever thanked me. <laughs> That's so painful. I've, I've, only, um, I've only woken up that early a couple times, but it, it was well worth it, like getting up for an excursion to see the glaciers in Alaska, you well, know, moments I'll, that take I'll your breath it, away. I'll put it in a different way. It. There are two five-letter words that need to come out of your vocabulary whenever it comes to travel. One word that's got to go is later, because... Every time you use that word in a sentence, you either don't do it as well or you don't do it at all. And the second word that has to immediately disappear is plans. Ah. Because you become a prisoner of those plans. You don't have, a, you don't have a, an alternate. Look, how many times, everybody watching this, I'll guarantee you this. If I were to ask you what are your best memories when you traveled, it's when plan A didn't work, you turned right or maybe even got lost, and that's where you met the person that changed your life. That's where you met the woman who sold flowers on the street who told you the story of her life. That's where you met the person who took you in the back alley to a restaurant that you never knew existed. Yeah. So you know what? You use your tour guide book as a point of departure, not as a point as a Bible. It doesn't work. Right. That, that's, that's so true. We've, we've had and by the way, all the shore excursion people who are listening to me now on the cruise lines <laughs> learn from that. Yeah, no, that is so true, though, because I'm looking back into my own experience and thinking of, you know, all the times where things went wrong, where we're stranded on the side of the road and the car broke, broke down. And that's where it's the most memorable. And we have, uh, you know, how we came out of that situation yeah. is, yeah. you know, the best travel memories and the stories. And they work. They work. I'm telling you.
<laughs> you have actually talked to um, some great full-time cruisers like Mama Lee, who has lived on Crystal Cruise Line. I had the opportunity to meet her as well, along with Super Mario. These are full-time cruisers who live on respectively Royal Caribbean and Crystal Cruises. There's a lot of people out there who do exactly what they do, um, who may not have, we know their name as familiar, but or even do it almost full time. So what is something like for them, their, their life is really shaken up. They're on land. They're learning how to use their land legs. And uh, that world is totally different for them right now and into the near future. But for people who are still looking to get into that, what would you kind of say? Would you advise against that? Or Well, it's not a question of getting into it. It sort of evolves. Uh, we did a piece on CBS about Mama Lee. Right. Um, one of our highest rated segments on CBS because everybody either has a mom or has a daughter and there, but for the grace of God, that could be them. And Mama Lee actually perfected it. Um, and what she did was she was, you know, happily married and, and she and her husband used to cruise a lot. Mm -hmm. And one day he was, you know, unfortunately got sick and, and was, and was about to pass away. And on his deathbed, he looked at her, he said, keep cruising. And she said, okay. And <laughs> what she did really was- really to she, heart. And when I spoke with her as well, her fire and desire to keep cruising, you know, being on land is not what she wants to do. She no, wants to be out what? dancing on that ship and living her, 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 her life at sea. Listen, if I could figure out a way to do that, I'd do it too. Would um, you? Oh, yeah, the technology exists for me to broadcast from anywhere. We've just proven that now during the pandemic. Yeah, you're putting um, it to practice. And in Los Angeles, I live on a boat, so I'm used to it. Uh, but in her case, she made a lifestyle, a, a, a very big lifestyle choice to basically sell her house, sell her belongings, sell her car, didn't sell the clothes. Uh, so they had to build her a separate <laughs> Or the jewelry. Or the jewelry. So they had to sell, they had to build her a separate closet and a little bit of expanded cabin on the ship and she essentially almost became a member of the crew yeah. uh, because everybody knew, knew her as Mama Lee and what she would do every day which I thought was just so cute and charming was every night she would dress up with a new outfit a new gown and a, and a new you know and the jewelry and the shoes and she'd go down to the to the ballroom right where they still had like a five or six piece band and for, for an hour and a half, she'd dance. Yeah. And, and you know, that was a ship that does have male hosts. Mm -hmm. So there was, she was never at a loss for a partner. And if she could dance every day, she'd be happy sailing for the rest of her life. And you know what? There's a lot to be said for that. I would like to be dancing every day. Aw, <laughs> that's so sweet. Let me give you an idea of the shows that we do. In okay. addition to what I do uh, for CBS News, I also do my radio show on CBS. It's three hours a week, normally from a different location in the world every week. We do that 51 weeks a year. Obviously, for the last eight weeks, we've been doing the show here from my temporary studios in my bunker. <laughs> but it's not a typical travel show. It doesn't talk about lovely London or beautiful Bermuda. It's, you know, which airline is lying to you about their frequent flyer program? Which hotel oh. has the best or worst security? Uh, which cruise line got caught dumping? You know, uh, people need to know who's got the best environmental programs, who's got the worst. Um, I'm not out there to promote travel. I'm there to present it in a way through the process of travel that people can then make intelligent choices about where they want to go and how they want to go. Um, you know, you're not going to hear me talk about the great deals of the day. You'll never hear about an 800 number if you call now. That's not my show. We're not a brochure. Uh, we are not a, a marketing vehicle. We are a news show. Mm -hmm. And uh, as such, you'll hear all the CEOs on that show. Everybody, everywhere from uh, everybody from Arnold Donald and Richard Fain to Frank Del Rio have all done the show. Um, recently on Memorial Day weekend, we had the CEO of Southwest Airlines. We had the, the CEO of United Airlines. Uh, this is where we could actually ask questions in an extended format, not just a soundbite, to get conversations going so people understand the process, right. whether they like it or not. So that's the CBS radio show. I think and in the same guess. vein, for the last, 
I'm sorry, what? I was just going to say, I think a great guest for that CBS radio show would be Super Mario, another full-time cruiser who yeah. you want to live on, on your boats as well. Uh, you know, he has been living on Royal Caribbean for over 20 years. So a great person you know to, to pick your brain. When they get back and sail again, I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll yeah, I think him. that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and, then in the, and, then in the same, and then in the same vein of the radio show, uh, the radio show we've been doing for 20 years, uh, uh, for the last seven years, we were doing a show on PBS called The Travel Detective, and it's the same thing. Uh, think of it as 60 minutes in Dateline of travel. Um, and, uh, and on that show, by the way, we will do places you've never seen before, like St. Helena. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, you know, or Port Said, or just crazy stuff. Uh, we just did a show, speaking of cruising, that is going to air in about three months, and I recommend it highly, on the oldest cruise ship sailing in the world. Oh, it's wow. the Astoria. Do you know the Astoria? I've heard Have of it, heard but of I, I, I don't know that much about it. Please do tell. All right. Let me tell you the, the first. This ship is still sailing, and it is 72 years old. Incredible. 72 years old. It wasn't always called the Astoria. It was originally called the Stockholm, and it has a notorious history because it was the Stockholm in 1956 that rammed into the Adria Doria and sank it off the coast of Nantucket. And the largest uh, you know, basic cruise ship disaster in American history, in, in American waters. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you what happened, but let's just say the Astoria is still sailing uh, 65 years after that incident. And wow. it's pretty wild. I mean, the stories that are on that ship and what it's been through, where it's been, how many names it's had, how many owners it's had, how many paint jobs it's had. Um, <laughs> and, and the history is still there. Uh, and as you know, I, I, I challenge anybody watching this to tell me any other cruise ship that's 72 years old or even close to it. But I'm telling you, it's definitely old school. I mean, we're talking portholes, but I'm, but I'm telling you, worth it. And uh, you'll see that story on The Travel Detective. And as they like to say, it's on PBS, check your local listings. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to look forward to that. Thank you so much. That'll, that'll be one episode that I definitely have to tune into. So Peter, what are all of your socials? Where can people find you? We'll list everything down below, but go ahead and tell us. Sure. Uh, my, my website, which also is my newsletter, which is not transactional. We're not selling anything. It's all informational. has the most imaginative name, petergreenberg.com. Uh, my handle on Twitter is at Peter S. Greenberg and facebook.com slash Peter Greenberg. You can find me on all those. Also on YouTube, of course. Uh, and you'll see a lot of our segments on YouTube as well. The last thing I didn't mention uh, is we do a show as a series of major global specials every year called the Royal Tour. And we've been doing that for 20 years, where I go to individual sitting heads of state, kings, presidents, prime ministers. And believe it or not, they, they dedicate seven days of their schedule just to me, That's just incredible. the two of us. And then for the next seven days, we are literally crisscrossing the country with them as my tour guide. Uh, they have no right of editorial control. They have no right of editorial review. The very first time they see it is when it premieres on television. And we've done everybody from the King of Jordan to the Prime Minister of New Zealand to the President of Mexico to Netanyahu in Israel to the President of Rwanda. Uh, we did the President of Ecuador. Well, it's, what's on the air right now is the Prime Minister of Poland. And we have seven more in the schedule over the next two and a half years, uh, which I can't reveal yet because those announcements are usually made by the heads of state themselves. Oh, also, also on PBS. That's so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and everything that's coming up for you. Definitely when things get back to normal, you're going to be back to your normal busy self with all of your travel and getting on the road. I know you're, you're itching for the new normal, right? Well, what I've done in the interim is I've created a new passport and I stamp it every time I go from my bedroom to the living room because it makes me feel better. Yeah, so you probably uh, are going to need some extra passport pages then for sure. Oh, I've already run out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll head down to the passport office and get you a new one then. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Peter, so much. I can't believe all the great insight. I thank you so much. And everyone at home, if you have any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. And if you enjoyed our chat, please do give the video a big thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, ciao for now.